I have um, a simple word to share with you this morning, but if I preach it right, it will cut to your core. Yay, Merry Christmas. <laughs> but it will also give you, I think, great hope and um, anticipation for the upcoming new year. So a simple word, it's what the Lord's been teaching me, and I want to preface it with something um, just so you can kind of have context and understanding, okay? <laughs> All right, so the Lord has been taking me on this journey, you know, really ever since I was born. <laughs> The same is true for you. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you've looked back and seen the Lord's hand in your life, even times when you didn't know that he was with you. Um, but he has been revealing to me layer by layer his goodness and faithfulness to me, and he's been inviting me into something deeper. And it has largely been a result, actually, of my marriage. Um, I have the great joy of being married to Jamie, as you guys know, and um, yeah, you can cheer for that. <laughs> and it is definitely the best thing besides Jesus in my life by far. Um, and sometimes you people, <laughs> you people, will ask me if he um, ever intimidates me. And... Um, yeah. <laughs> but also, he is hands down the kindest, most loving, most amazing person that I have ever known. And my journey with him, I've known him, and I promise I am getting to somewhere, not just to brag. <laughs> um, but I've known him most of my life. And since we've been married, you know, it's a different type of journey when you're in a covenant with somebody and you go through 20 plus years and you have eight kids and you go through miscarriages and you go through moves and, you know, there's highs and lows. And as you're walking that journey with somebody, it changes things. And what it did for me, I'm just going to share because this, I think, will be helpful to you guys. But um, early on in our marriage, Jamie and I went through a really difficult time. And I carried baggage from that time with me. And you know, when you go through life, if you aren't careful, and we all do this, we accumulate baggage as we go. And I was in the season in my life where the Lord was trying to get my attention and he was trying to bring healing to me, but I was looking around at my circumstances, and I had blame, <laughs> and I had bitterness, and I had hurt in my heart, and I had no idea it was there. And the Lord showed me this picture, and I was walking with baggage, like in my arms. So my arms were out like this, and there was luggage stacked up higher than my head. You know, and I had stuff hanging off my arms, too. It was like, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you try to carry it all in in one trip. Anyone else do that? Like, we have a family of 10. That's a lot of groceries, but I give it my all, right? <laughs> you know, so it was like that in the extreme. And as soon as I saw this picture, here I am, I'm trying to walk, and I can't see where I'm going, I realized that all of my vision was clouded by baggage but I didn't know so I thought I was seeing clearly I thought I was seeing reality but instead I was seeing everything through my baggage and when I saw that picture I knew the Lord was asking me to put it down and what I wasn't prepared for in that moment was how terrifying that would be because I didn't even know I was carrying it, but as soon as I saw it and I knew that I was being asked to relinquish it, I realized that my baggage had become my armor. That it was my security, that it was my protection. And the Lord was asking me to lay it down. And not only was this about my relationship with the Lord, but it was about my relationship with my husband, my relationship with people, 
I was experiencing everything through this lens that wasn't correct. And so I made the choice to lay it down, and it was a process, and it was terrifying, and it was hard. And the most amazing thing <laughs> is that I'm married to a man who has chosen to love me no matter what. And I've chosen to love him no matter what, too. And so we have this covenant, as he says, you know, you let the covenant do the work. But in the process of choosing commitment and love, no matter where the journey went, it gave me the freedom to be safe without my armor. It gave me the freedom to be authentic and to be real. And that is the start of the journey of me really being able to be free and to be whole. The thing about this, it's so beautiful, but it's really messy. You know, being completely honest and authentic, it's hard enough to do that with yourself, much less to do it with another person. But Jamie and I have made the choice that we are going to love each other no matter what, that we're in it no matter what. And so if we face a hurdle, if we have a mess, if there's, you know, something that has to be made right or confessed or we have to figure out or work through, there is no question that we're going to do that the best that we can with love and that we're going to persevere until we get to the other side. And that has created such safety and it's been such a source of healing and wholeness and security in my life. But I'm sharing that with you not... <laughs> The message isn't about marriage, although I hope you will imply it, apply it <laughs> to your marriage. But I'm sharing this with you because this is what you're invited to with the Lord. And I think today he's going to take away some of our luggage, and he is going to invite you again on a journey that is amazing and wonderful and beautiful, and it is going to be messy and he wants you to be okay with that. You don't have to figure out how to do it. You just have to say yes. Yes, Lord. I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to be loved by you. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be real. It's going to be terrifying, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be the most beautiful, life-transforming, amazing thing. Okay? <laughs> All right. So you can clap for that. I think that was a little better. <laughs> so I am going to pray for us, and then I'm going to share a word that is simple, but hopefully will be very empowering and encouraging. So Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you're here, and that you are with us, and that it is safe to be in your presence. Lord, I thank you that life with you isn't easy, but it is beautiful. And that you've done all the hardest parts. And so, Lord, I just ask right now that you would provide your Holy Spirit in abundant measure to every heart that's hearing this. And that you would connect with them and you would speak with them. That you would be doing surgery, you'd be removing baggage, and you would be preparing us for the future. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Matthew 7, verse 24 says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were, crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. All right, I grew up in church, and I'm very familiar with this story. You know, I think there was probably a flannel graph. There's a veggie tail based on it. There's all kinds of things. This is a familiar story. And it wasn't until recently, though, that I realized I was misunderstanding it my whole life, <laughs> that I was misapplying it. And so this is the focus of what we're going to talk about today. 
Now, The Secret of the Wise Men is the title of my sermon, by the way. (laughs) And to be wise in this passage, this is what it means. It means intelligent, wise, prudent, mindful of one's interests, and sensible and practical. So the gist of it is that this is a wisdom that you gather by being observant and being thoughtful and applying it to your life so that you are producing prudent action, action that will lead to a good result. So this is not just learning knowledge, but it is something that you are actually having to put thought into, you're having to pay attention, and then because you are learning something, you are applying it actively in your life and doing something about it. All right? In contrast, the foolish person here is, it means dull, stupid, heedless. Um, My favorite word that it used was blockhead. Okay, so the picture, though, isn't about somebody on purpose doing foolish things. It's somebody who's not really paying attention, whose senses are dulled, who's not putting what they hear into action. Okay, so the wise man is prudently learning and acting upon what he learns. And the foolish man is like, we all have been, after we've binged Netflix or something, (laughs) you know, have you ever gotten in those modes? No, you guys are probably much more holy than me. But um, I recently went through COVID and spent a lot more time in bed than I have, I don't know, like ever. And, um, And I was quarantined and I was missing people. I'm used to having people around me. And so what did I do? I watched television. And I'm gonna tell you that when your mind is entertained, you aren't necessarily at your sharpest, right? (laughs) That's the picture, though, of what the foolish person is, is that there's someone who's just not actively applying what they're learning. Now, (laughs) I applied this passage my whole life, talking or thinking about it as salvation, that this was teaching us that if we were saved, then Jesus was our foundation and we were built on the rock. It was a very passive process in my mind. It was a one-time thing. You accept Jesus, you pray the prayer, now your life is built on the rock, and you're going to have a firm foundation. But the reality of this is that that's not what Jesus was talking about. And so we're going to get to that in a minute, but he is talking about something far greater. Um, I love watching snowboarding documentaries. I've mentioned this before, but yeah, they're fun, right? (laughs) I love watching um, extreme sports, rock climbing, surfing, skateboarding, all those things. I have learned to Google the people that I'm watching about because I just want to know if they're going to (laughs) live. It's it's good to know. I was on a plane one time, and (laughs) not to blame my husband and throw him under the bus, but he had recommended a movie to me on a plane. Okay, so I'm sitting next to strangers, and he told me this movie was a really good movie that I'd really like it, and it was about a surfer who dies, and so at the end of it, I was sobbing in between two strangers, like, (laughs) anyway, and he did get an earful from me later, okay, but I have learned to Google about the people because I want to know that they live, but here's the thing. I have learned a lot watching the documentaries. I've even been to many of the mountains that snowboarders like to go. I've been to Jackson Hole. I like Big Sky, Montana. You know, I've been to the Alps in Europe. I even know how to ski. But something tells me that if I got to the top of a mountain and strapped a board on, that all of the knowledge I've learned, I mean, maybe the how to die part would be helpful. (laughs) But something tells me that I wouldn't actually have the skill to get safely down the mountain. Are you with me? Right? Same true as so many things in our life. NFL football. I'm a football fan. We won't go to teams. We'll just keep it nice and, you know, loving. Um, But I love watching football. I love watching all kinds of 
sports, but I love football probably the most to watch. And another thing that happened during COVID is I started watching Get Up on ESPN. And um, first take with Stephen A. afterwards. Any ESPN fans in here, right? But so I was watching a lot about football. And you can watch a lot and gain understanding. And if you ever listen to somebody who has an opinion about football, chances are they think they can do a better job than the people on the field, right? They think they can coach better. They think they could execute whatever play it was better than the, you know, yahoos on the screen just did. Like, we start to, when we submerse ourselves in something and we start thinking about it, we start believing that we actually have the experience to do something. And I have watched and listened to a lot of football talk, and I know there are some teams that are better than others and players that are better than others, but I'm pretty sure that any of them could take me in a game. <laughs> right? <laughs> so what is my point? I think as Christians, we get confused sometimes, and we think that Christianity is learned primarily in our head. And so we learn stuff, and we spend time in the Word, and we spend time at church, and we spend time in Bible studies, and all these things, which are really, really good, and we learn a lot of knowledge, and we get an opinion. We have a strong opinion, and we think we know the way that it should be. But when Jesus taught, the crowd was amazed because of the authority that he taught with. And obviously, he was the Son of God, but the authority that was amazing them was because everything he preached was completely true in his life. It wasn't head knowledge, it was real, it was tangible, it was a reality in his life. And there is a big difference between having head knowledge and experience. Because it is experience that actually gives you the skills. You don't start out an NFL player. You start out playing at a much lower level, and you work your way up. You know, as a Christian, <laughs> we actually do the same thing. We start out at a lower level, and it's the process that actually confirms in us the work of the Lord. It's the process that makes his words true. So Matthew 7, again, Jesus says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to the wise man. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man. Okay, this passage isn't talking about head knowledge. It's not talking about a religious, you know, cultural belief system. It's not talking about... <laughs> Praying the prayer of salvation. So what is it talking about? Jesus is saying, everyone who hears these words of mine. And he hadn't just presented the gospel. Now, I'm not going to take the time because it would kill us all to go through all the words that Jesus had spoken up until this point. But I'm going to read a little bit of it. Okay, so if you go back from this passage and you read through what Jesus had been teaching, you know, Matthew 5, he starts with the Beatitudes, which most of us can't even fully understand, much less implement wholly in our life, right? And then he says things like this. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Okay, these are pretty simple things. Like, we've heard these teachings before. And how many of you can say that they are fully in full force, like you've excelled in them, and they are a tangible reality in your life. And these are the easy things, okay? He goes on to say, you've heard it said that you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable. But I say to you that everyone who's angry should be guilty. Like, have you ever been angry at your brother? You know, he talks about 
how, you know, it's been said that you should not commit adultery, but I'm going to tell you that even if you look at someone with lust in your heart, that you're guilty. Like, these words that Jesus says, they're not easy words. You know, like, I'm not going to read much more, <laughs> but he goes on talking about how you're supposed to relate to heaven, how you're supposed to be relating to people. You know, he talks about how you're supposed to be living in faith and not be anxious about anything. Have any of you felt anxious about anything? Right? Or he says things like this, don't judge so that you're not judged. For the way you judge, you'll be judged by your standard of measure. It will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own? Like, if you're not convicted hearing these things, I don't know the gentle way to say this, but you're deceived. You know, like, it is so painful to read the words of Jesus when you're comparing it to the standard that you've excelled at in your life. Or maybe I should just speak for myself. <laughs> it's so painful for me when I read the words of Jesus. So painful, but in a good way, because I know that I have so far to go. That those words, I can't speak with the same authority that he did, because his words are not true in my life in the same degree that they were in his. If you're not feeling convicted yet, I have more. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to read Matthew 7 in the message because it's really painful. All right. <laughs> Matthew 7, verses 24, uh, starting there. It says this. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, or tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. And when a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. <laughs> if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life. Ouch. I love Bible studies. <laughs> I love reading the word. It's the primary way that I connect with the Lord. I love it. I get hungry for it if I don't spend time in it. I read it in all kinds of different translations. Like, I enjoy it so much. And so when I read that, <laughs> and I think of the time I've spent in the word, I think of the time I've spent in church learning the words of Jesus. And then I look at my life. I go, ouch. Ouch. I've been like this stupid carpenter. I can look back in my life and I can see the places where I've been shaky, the storms I've gone through that hasn't gone well, and every single one of them is because I haven't been putting into practice the words of Jesus in my life. You know, he's been faithful and he's been good and he's gotten me through them, but they're all things that could have been prevented. I could have withstood in a different way through the storm, if only I hadn't been satisfied knowing something in my head, but I had actually worked at it in such a way that it would produce fruit in my life and be a real and tangible thing. So the words of Jesus are a lot. And I imagine right now that you might be feeling a little discouraged. Because to think about applying the words of Jesus to your life like that can be crushing. But I have good news. And the good news is that it's a process. And the process is the gift. You know, when you become a Christian, the moment you become a Christian, the moment you turn to Jesus, 
with faith in your heart, something happens that is real and tangible and it's unshakable. You are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. There is a new heart <laughs> that is inside of you. There is an eternal work that has already happened and nothing can take that away. And I'm not trying to in any way diminish that experience. But what happens in that moment too is that you begin a process that you're gonna be in for the rest of your life. And this isn't something to be discouraged about. It's actually the Lord's goodness and grace that it works like this. You know, it's like parenting. I have eight kids, and my oldest is going to be 19 this winter, which is crazy to me. Um, but when I think back to when he was born, you know, he cried the entire car ride home. He was born in North Carolina. Jamie was in the Air Force at the time. So he was born at Womack Army Hospital. And... When we left to go to our apartment, he screamed and screamed and screamed the entire car ride home. And this was perplexing because I had been told that babies loved the car, that if they didn't sleep, in fact, people would drive them around in the car and it would put them to sleep, right? And I remember saying to Jamie, like, he's crying because he knows we don't know what we're doing. And he's like, afraid, why are you sending me home with these people, you know? Like, what I realized later was that he just actually legitimately hated the car. Like, he cried every car ride. He cried from North Carolina to Minnesota. And thinking about it now, I don't know if he's in here, and if you are, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but um, thinking about it now, maybe it's because he knew all the road trips we'd be taking, and so <laughs> he was just preemptively, like, getting out some of his grief about that. I don't know, <laughs> but the thing about it is when you become pregnant, it's a good idea to learn a couple things about what it's going to be like to have a baby. You know, gather some supplies, but what you read and what you learn, even watching or talking to people who have done it, is nothing compared to you being on your own and actually having to figure it out. You know, and there is something that happens as you go through that process that changes you. You know, when you first become a parent, you're a mom or a dad because there's a baby that never leaves. They're always there. <laughs> You know, and so your identity changes. But over time, even if your children are with you or not, you're a mother or a father. You're a mom or a dad. You know, and it doesn't matter what situation you're in because you have transformed and you have become a parent. I remember yelling at kids at the mall that were not mine <laughs> and being shocked. I'm still a little shocked when I think about it, but there were kids that were on purpose, like, running up and down, and they were banging on things, and they were freaking people out, and they were taking stuff down and, like, throwing it on the ground, and they were just causing chaos on purpose, and I yelled at them, and I wasn't, like, mean, angry, but it was like, no, this, no, you don't. This isn't who you are. This isn't how you behave in here. You better stop right now, and they looked at me, and guess what? They stopped. <laughs> it didn't matter that I wasn't their mom. I was a mom when the situation called for it. I had been so transformed by parenthood that I was able to step in because being a mom now is just something that I can't escape. Right? This is what it's supposed to be like. This is what the journey is like as a Christian. You know, I don't have it all figured out as a parent now. I am learning more all the time. I've never parented an adult child before. You know, I've never had a 19-year-old and a 3-year-old before. And let me tell you, crazy. You know, like I am learning new things all the time. But now the things I'm learning are being added to a sure foundation in my life because I've already become a parent, right? I've learned some things. <laughs> I have a long way to go, but I've come a long way. And this is what it's like as a Christian. That's why when you read the words of Jesus, you shouldn't be discouraged by them, but you should be inspired because you know that the journey you're on with him is actually going to produce these things in the end. You just have to continue on the journey and not quit. <laughs> the more you become like Jesus, the more you realize how unlike him you actually are. That's the crazy thing. The more you grow, the longer you walk with him, like 
the more you see how far you have to go. But the thing about it is that you become like Paul. Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, It's a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Well, this is Paul. If Paul is the foremost of all sinners, then we are all in trouble. Right? <laughs> Like Paul, he started out as Saul, but he had this encounter with the Lord, and the scales were removed from his eyes, and he became Paul, and nothing was ever the same, and he was intimately connected to the Lord, and the world was changed, and he wrote the books of the Bible, you know, like, this is Paul, and I guarantee you when he's saying this, that he means it, that it's true, but that he's also not saying it with a sense of shame or discouragement. Because the truth of the matter is, is that even though you realize your own shortcomings more, <laughs> that you realize how far you have to go, you also know the goodness and faithfulness of God. I have so much confidence in the goodness of my Father that I'm not comfortable with sin. I'm not okay with it. I don't wink my eye at it. In fact, I'm much more sensitive to sin in my life than I used to be. You know, I, I, ha I see the flaws. I know the imperfections. I mean, I'm sure I don't know all of them because God's trying not to kill me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I know that I'm not perfect. I can see how far he's brought me, but I know I have so long to go. But I'm not daunted by that at all because I now understand that it's not me that has to do that. But that he, yes, you can clap for that too. That is good news. <laughs> that he's going to do it. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Like, he's going to perfect it. He's going to complete it. He started you on a journey, and now he's going to bring you through a process of completing what he started. And this is good news because he's going to do it so much better than you can. He is more faithful. <laughs> he is so much more wise. He is more powerful. He is more everything good. And you have only experienced a little bit of his goodness in your life. There is so much more. And so when you see and understand how much you have to go, how far the journey is to actually take the words of Jesus and be the smart carpenter, be encouraged because he is with you. He is patient, he is faithful, and he is going to be the one who is going to bring you on the journey that's going to make this a reality in your life. You know, I love the story of Peter, the disciple. He's like one of my favorites. And I think it's because, you know, every now and then you could see where Peter acted maybe a little foolishly, right? He says things. He blurts stuff out. I can just imagine. You know, it's like a really holy moment. Jesus is teaching the disciples. And everyone's just like quiet and understanding, you know, and like, the presence of the Lord is there shifting things, right? And then Peter's oblivious to all of it. And he, like, opens his mouth and says something, and the mood's, like, broken, and everybody's like, Peter, you know? Like, I mean, maybe that's not how it is, but that's how it is in my mind, I think, because it reassures me. <laughs> you know, it reassures me. And when you look at Peter, you know, Peter, <laughs> he had such passion and such zeal, and he was on a real journey with the Lord. And so he becomes, he goes from being the one who betrays Jesus in the darkest moment to being one who would represent him, who would preach eloquently, who would live his life in such a way that brought such glory to the Lord. You know, Peter's the one at the end of his life, he's crucified upside down because he didn't even find himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Savior. Like, that's Peter's journey with the Lord. And the Lord's with us just like that. 
Like, he's part of our process, and he sees the end, and he knows what he has to do, what he has to teach us, how he has to lead us in order to get us to where we're supposed to go. So this is good news. So I'm, in closing, just going to give you three practical steps, okay? Three practical steps. What am I asking you to do? How can we be like wise men who can embrace the process and actually produce something of substance in our life? The first thing is love the Lord. <laughs> now, amen, of course. We love Jesus. Come and we worship him. You know, but I don't just mean that. I'm talking about the kind of love that I was talking about at the beginning. The vulnerable love. The one where you lay all your baggage down. The one where you commit to being authentic and real. Where you actually trust the Lord with all of yourself. You don't hide away any of the dark pieces. You know, any of the things that have been hidden. Like, I used to come before the Lord cowering. You know, like I had been a Christian since when I was young, but the thought of coming into his presence was so scary and terrifying and intimidating. I didn't want to look at his face. There was shame. There was all kinds of things that were over me, and I didn't feel like I could go in his presence, not safely. I was too busy trying to hide. <laughs> but do you know that you can't love or be loved by the Lord if that's the position that you take? So when you love him, you have to love him wholeheartedly. You have to let your covenant with him and his love provide the security for you to embrace the process. Be loved by the Lord and love him back. The second thing is listen to him. So embrace the process, love him, but don't try to control the process. It's very easy, especially with our lives, to think we know best. But we don't. The Lord does. And he's going to lead you, and he's going to teach you. And you have to listen to him. You have to be open to hear what he has to say and to believing what it is that he's teaching you. And then the third thing is obey him. Love him. Listen to him. Obey him. Do what he says. These are all simple things in theory. But putting them into practice will change everything because when he tells you something, when you're convicted, don't run away, don't hide in shame, don't go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, when conviction comes, he's not trying to shame you. He's not trying to get an apology from you. What he's trying to do is change you. So <laughs> when conviction comes, change. When you see how he behaves and you know you're not behaving the same way, then start to act like he does. The truth is that the only reason that we don't obey the Lord is because we don't trust him. Like, it's, he tells us to do something, we go, well, that's a bad idea. You know, we may not realize that's what we're saying, but that's what we say. You know, I didn't want to be a mom way back when. My journey was the Lord came to me and said, you need to trust me. And I was like, I do trust you. And he said, okay, great. How about in this area? And I was like, hmm, that's a bad idea. You know, like, <laughs> I don't think so. And then knowing that he was asking me of it, and I had to say yes, because that's what you do as a Christian. You follow him where he leads. You know, I'm going, okay, fine. I'm going to follow you even though you're killing me. Like, okay. You know, and he was killing me. He was killing me, but he knew what he was doing, and he was leading me into a brand new life that was more amazing and beautiful than I would have ever known to choose for myself. And I could give you example after example, but I don't have to because you have them in your own life too. When he is asking you to do something, know that if you are not obedient, it's not really an obedience. Like that's not the root issue. The issue is that you're not trusting him. And you need to know that he is good, that he is trustworthy, that his ways are better than yours. And if you stop trying to control things, if you love him, you listen to him, and you obey him, he is going to lead you into life that's more beautiful and amazing than you can ever imagine. <laughs> and that is good news. So if you guys can stand, 
I'll take I told the first service. Jamie doesn't like golf claps, but I'm okay with it, so I'll take what I get, right? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pray over you guys, and what I want you to do is I want you, I know that we're nearing the end of service time, but I finished way earlier than Jamie normally does, so I think you can be patient for just a couple moments longer, right? <laughs> I want you to just take a minute and close your eyes and actually allow yourself to be before the presence of the Lord. Allow him to minister to you. Because the point of today <laughs> is certainly not another Bible study. The point of today is for there to be a real thing that the Lord does in your heart. So Father, I just thank you that you are here. And Lord, I ask that you would bring courage to each person listening to this to lay down any baggage that they have, anything that's separating them, anything that they're holding on to to protect themselves from you but that they, there would just be a grace, there would be a courage that would well up right now in their hearts to just let go and to be authentically vulnerable before you. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to us, that you are better than we know, that you are patient and you are kind, that you are leading us, that you don't ever leave us or forsake us. And so, Lord, people in here that are looking at the journey ahead and not sure how they're going to do it, Lord, I just ask right now that you would show them your presence clearly, that they would know that they're not doing it alone, but that you're with them, that you're going to give them strength, that you're going to give them wisdom, that you're going to be there giving them grace and comforting them. Oh, Lord, give people courage. Bring healing, bring wholeness, bring freedom. <laughs> and Lord, lastly, I just ask that you would help us all to trust you more. That when you say something, Father, I'm praying over my own heart right now, Lord. I'm asking that you would help me to hear you clearly and that when I hear you that I would act. And I'm praying that same thing for my family and I'm praying that same thing for this church, Father. That we would not be just a place that longs for your presence, but that we would be a people that know you and love you and that we would walk according to your ways. That your words would be sure, Father, that we would be secure in any storm and that we would be a safe place for others to come. Father, that they would be able to come in from the storms and they would be able to encounter you. Not just at our church building, Father, but in, our, in their interactions with us because we would be so sure, so confident, so solidly built on you. So just thank you, Father. And lastly, I just want to bless each person here. Each person listening, I just release a blessing that your face... <laughs> would be upon them with such a smile that as they go throughout this week and this beautiful Christmas season that there would be a awakening of just new awe at your glory and your goodness father that we would enter into a new year fully confident in you and anticipating great things because of what you're doing in our lives so just thank you, Father, and just bless each person here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, guys.